uh, we are now starting a new chapter. We made our way through the third chapter of Galatians. Uh, so today we get to begin at the, at the fourth chapter. Uh, and I'm, pardon me, I'm just going to move my, uh, my camera and computer around a little bit to make room for my, uh, uh, my, my Bible here on the table. Uh, pardon me just a moment. Um, there we go. Uh, hey, everybody. I uh, goofed up with the recording of this video, um, and so I missed the first few minutes of our Bible study on Zoom. But I'll just recap uh, what I was saying, is that we're in this fourth chapter of Galatians. Paul has already been talking about our, um, the, 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 the responsibility of the law or what, the, what God does with the law. Um, and he compares this relationship uh, to us with a, a tough school teacher. Um, that is, that the law serves a purpose, just like a tough school teacher kind of keeps the students from uh, just, you know, taking over the classroom and making a mess of things. Um, and, and now Paul says, uh, makes a very similar point uh, in Galatians 4, uh, comparing our relationship to God, um, or I should say our relationship under the law, uh, to being like uh, children living uh, with, um, you know, Paul says, uh, living with guardians or trustees, or to use the King James, tutors, governors. Uh, and when Paul says governors here, it's sort of like the, you know, the governess. Um, you know, you might think of um, Fräulein Maria in The Sound of Music, who is uh, sent to take care of these kids. Uh, now we'll go back to the recording from Zoom. Uh, there were uh, many people who tried to care for those kids, uh, but weren't able to. Uh, because <laughs> those kids really, they really pushed the limits. Um, they really tested the authority of their governesses. So it took, it took, a, it took a strong hand. It took a strict, um, you know, authoritarian figure. And now, um, you know, Fräulein Maria, she loved those kids. She came to love those kids, even came to be their, their mother, um, you know, through marriage. Uh, but, you know, she had to rule them uh, with a lot of firmness. Um, and, and Paul is saying this is how it works for, for the heir. Uh, that, in a sense, you are no better than a slave or a servant. You're going to get bossed around by the governess for your own protection, for your own welfare, so that you are safe and so that you learn. Um, you know, the heir of the house uh, is going to get bossed around by the adults in charge. And in that sense, it'll look no different than being a slave. Uh, but here is the difference, Paul says. Uh, this is back in verse 1. He says, though they are the owners of all the property, uh, or in the King James even, uh, though he be lord of all. I mean, so as children of God, uh, we're going to live uh, in this world again under the law because of our sin. But at the same time, there is a, there's another reality at play, uh, which is that even though we are sort of bossed around or held in check uh, by the law, nonetheless, we are God's children uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, so that we are still owners of all the property. We are lords of all. Uh, so that we have this wonderful, exalted relationship with God. Uh, but so long as we're in this world, uh, we're going to continue to have to deal with the law. But now Paul's point about all of this is to say that the law and the commandments, Moses, uh, those are only temporary. Uh, those, the, the, the law is not our eternal custodian. Um, but uh, Paul says in verse 2, uh, they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. Uh, that word in until is very important uh, in Paul's letters, is that uh, it, it shows that, again, that uh, our, our position before the law is, is not forever, uh, but that, uh, you know, the, the, these little kids, eventually they grow up, and then they're not under guardians and trustees and governors and governesses uh, any longer. Uh, so verse 3, Paul says, So with us, while we were minors, uh, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world, all right? So Paul is saying that we are like those heirs. Uh, we're like those heirs living in, a, in, the, in the household um, who, you know, have governors. Uh, and so for a time being, uh, we are living like minors, enslaved, uh, Paul says, uh, or in bondage in the King James uh, to the elemental spirits of the world. Now, that, that's a really unique expression there. And, and uh, you know, we need to ask what that means when Paul says this, the elemental spirits of the world. Uh, Paul uses this expression a few times in his letters, uh, both in Galatians. Uh, he also uses it in 2 Corinthians uh, in the third chapter. Um, there's, a, there's a couple words here now that are getting translated. Um, the, where it says elemental spirits, okay, if you're looking at the NRSV, uh, that's really one Greek word. 
Um, and, and it can be translated in several different ways. Um, uh, it can be translated as elemental substances. You know, like sometimes people say the, the world is made up of four basic elements. This is kind of old fashioned science. You know, this would be science from like hundreds of years ago uh, when people say that everything in the world is made up of earth, air, fire, and water. You know, those are kind of classically considered the four basic elements of the world. Everything is made up of earth, air, uh, fire, and water. Uh, it, it, that, that's the Greek word there, uh, where Paul is saying that, you know, uh, we're enslaved to these elemental things. Now, that, that word can also mean other, that's not the only way that word can be translated, however. And really, um, another way it can be translated is um, just kind of the, the basic principles of life. So it can mean the, the, the elemental things, you know, air, wire, fire, water. It can also mean the basic principles of life. Um, you know, the, 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 the basic kind of ideas, the, the basic instructions that you need for life. In fact, you can also, it even, in, not in the Bible, but I think in some of the other Greek literature, early Greek literature, uh, it's even, it can refer to the, the, uh, the, the, el, the letters of the alphabet, okay? The, the building blocks uh, of, of our language, the, the, the alphabet. So in, in other words, the point is what, when, what Paul is referring to here is the basic stuff of this world whether it's basic material stuff, basic ideas, basic letters of the alphabet, um, this is what Paul is saying. We were enslaved to the elemental spirits or the basic stuff of the world, okay? And that's the other word here, okay? There's two words. Like I said, there's two words Paul puts together here. The elemental spirits, that's one word, of the world. That's the other, other word. And it's, it's important for us to recognize this, that Paul says, of the world. In, in Greek, uh, the word is cosmos. Now, that's a word that sometimes we even use in English, cosmos. Uh, the cosmos, it means the world. Uh, Paul says that the, the basic stuff of the cosmos. And, that, and that's a really big word in, in the Bible uh, because it means that we're talking about stuff of this world, not the stuff of eternity. Uh, that Paul is saying that we are enslaved uh, to the, the basic stuff of this world. Um, and, and now what, what Paul is saying here, Paul, when he says this, the elemental spirits of the world, again, it's a weird expression uh, to our ears, but what he's, this, this is Paul uh, describing the law. This is Paul describing Moses, the commandments. And what he's doing here, and he does this in a lot of places in his letters, is he is really sort of putting the law in its place. He is speaking in, in sort of insulting language, really, about the law and what it does for us. Uh, and, and, it, and, and we have to sort of step back and kind of say, my goodness, if this had not come from the great apostle Paul, uh, I might be offended at this. I mean, because what he's, he's talking about Moses here. I mean, he's talking about the words God himself spoke from Mount Sinai and saying all of that is simply the, just the basic stuff of this world. Uh, in other words, this, this does not describe our heavenly position. This does not describe uh, how it is that we are made righteous before God. The law doesn't do any of that. The law is simply the basic rules for this life, the elemental spirits. And again, Paul does this in so many places in his letters. Um, you, know, my, you, you know, one of the famous places, Paul says, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. I mean, that's Paul saying that the law does one thing, the Spirit of God does another. The law, Moses, the letter of the law, that just kills us. Uh, but it's the Spirit of God who gives us life. Um, again, this is Paul putting the law in its place, and he has to do this for the Galatians and for us. Because the Galatians thought, oh, you know, that, that circumcision, it sounds, it sounds like such a holy thing uh, that God commanded Abraham to do. Circumcision, it, boy, it must be something important. If God commanded Abraham, it really must be important. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if, we will be, if we are going to be justified before God, if we're going to have peace in our hearts, we've got to do it because God commanded Abraham uh, and all of his children to do it. Uh, so if we're ever going to find any peace in our hearts, if we're going to find peace or uh, if, if we're going to find friendship with God, we need to do these things. And Paul's saying, no, uh, that, that's just the, the, the elemental, that's elemental spirits of this world. That's, that's just the law. That's not, that's not how you're going to find peace in your heart. That's not how you're going to mend the relationship uh, between yourself and God. 
Um, this, this, will not, uh, this will not defeat sin. It will not defeat death. Uh, that's just the basic stuff of, of this life. And so Paul is, again, he's sort of in speaking in these insulting terms of the law uh, to try to say that uh, that's not the law's purpose. Uh, only Christ himself can do this, and he will do it uh, through faith. Uh, it is faith uh, that mends the relationship uh, between us and God. Uh, so Paul says, uh, again, verse 3, While we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world, enslaved to the law. All right? But verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. Okay, so again, here's the contrast. Um, for a time we were enslaved under the elemental spirits of the world, that is, under the law. But now, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us. Um, this is very much like what John says in the first chapter. We've referred to this before in this Bible study when uh, John says, uh, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, both of these things come from God. I mean, you know, God spoke the law to Moses. Uh, but John, is, you know, John there does something similar to Paul to kind of put the law in its place. Okay? Yeah, the law, that just came through Moses. All right? that, you know, it's important. You got to listen to it. Follow it. You know, but the law isn't going to save you. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, so here Paul says, for a time, like kids, we had to deal with the, the slavery of the law. We were under Moses, the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, all right, the fullness of time. And, and this, this is a wonderful phrase also in Greek, uh, this, this fullness of time. Uh, this is a word you've probably heard. Uh, sometimes people translate this right from the Greek. They'll talk about the, the word is kairos, um, the, the, the kairos moment. Uh, this, is like, this is like the harvest. You know, that uh, I know this has been a rough farming season. We haven't had enough rain. Uh, nonetheless, the harvest will come. You know, already the fields, you can see everything growing. And you know it's all coming towards that, that ripe moment uh, when we'll send out the combines uh, and to, to get the crops off the field. That is that fullness moment, that beautiful, wonderful, rich moment, that right time when the harvest is ready. Uh, and this is how Paul describes it, this kairos, this harvest moment. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. Uh, so again, I mean, just very different ways that Paul is trying to help these Galatians out of this, this pickle that they're in. You know, these, these Galatians are just stuck. They can't get the law out of their conscience. And again, this applies to all of us. The law gets stuck in our conscience. Uh, we, ha we, we live under the law. We have to obey the law. The law serves a purpose. And Paul has been talking about that, how God uses the law to, to keep our sin in check and to expose the sin in our hearts. The law has a purpose. Uh, but the trouble is the law gets stuck in our conscience. And we think that everything depends on the law and how well we keep it, how good we are, how good our actions are, how good our words are, how good our intentions are. And the law just, it really takes over and just, it, it put, it makes us slaves um, so that we are either stuck then with despair, worrying about, you know, how poorly we've done, measured by the law, or we end up with pride. Oh, I'm, I've been really good at keeping the law. I mean, that's what happens when the law gets stuck in your conscience. You end up with despair or pride. And so Paul is trying to pry that loose to say, again, the law has its place, but it doesn't belong in the conscience. Only Christ can give you peace in your heart. Only Christ uh, can really mend that relationship between sinners and God uh, to redeem us. So again, Paul is going to make this constant comparison. The law elemental spirits of this world. Bah! Uh, but when the fullness of time had come, Christ came. God sent his son. Uh, and this is really beautiful how, he, how Paul says this. Uh, Paul says that Christ was born of a woman. Um, and that's, this, this is very important for us in our understanding of who Christ is, uh, that he is both God and man. Uh, notice uh, that uh, Paul doesn't say he was born of a man and a woman, but born of woman. Uh, which is to say that Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Joseph, even though Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, uh, nonetheless God 
uh, was Jesus' true heavenly father, uh, but Mary, his true, uh, his true mother. Um, and so uh, Jesus, born of a woman, uh, is, a, is a shorthand way of saying he is both God and man. Uh, but then, here's the real, the real point here uh, that Paul says in the end of verse 4, is that Jesus was born under the law. Is that as much as we ourselves, um, you know, we uh, are measured, uh, condemned by the law, for our sake, Jesus suffered the same thing. Uh, now, this is similar to what Paul says uh, to the Second Corinthians when he says that for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, uh, that Jesus knew no sin. That is, Jesus himself was above the law. Jesus himself, uh, uh, Jesus himself is, is, uh, is the, the, the perfect spotless lamb of God. Uh, but for our sakes, uh, he was born under the law uh, he put himself in the crosshairs, you might say. Um, you know that uh, you know uh, he put himself in the in the target, uh, knowing uh, that he was going to to be among us, uh, with us, accused just like us. Uh, as much as the law accuses and condemns us, it accused and condemned Christ. Again, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. You know, taking on our sin uh, on the cross so that he was born under the law so that he could suffer uh, what we suffer. And, and you, re you really see this. I mean, you really see it in, uh, th well, throughout Jesus' ministry, but it really comes into focus in the final days of his life. I mean, this is why we tell the passion, the suffering, the suffering of our Lord uh, is that uh, Jesus uh, suffered what we suffered. And so, you know, there in the garden, you know, he's praying to his father, let this cup pass. And you'll remember his, his sweat becomes like drops of blood. I mean, this is what it means to be born under the law and to face the, uh, the, 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 the wrath of God, to face the condemnation of the law just as we do. I mean, sweat like drops of blood. Or there on the cross, it becomes so just, uh, again, clear uh, and, and harrowing and, and uh, just... It, it just takes your breath away to hear Christ say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, to hear the Son of God cry out that his Father has abandoned him. Um, this, this, this is Christ born under the law, uh, that, that Christ is being accused and judged by the law. Uh, and, and again, we can say this, is, this was unfair, that the law would judge Christ. That's true. I mean, uh, this was an unjust condemnation. Uh, what, what happened with Pilate and, and all the people in Jerusalem, this was an unfair trial. Uh, but nonetheless, this was what Christ wanted. He wanted to be condemned for our sins. Uh, so he was born under the law so that uh, just as the law uh, accuses us, it would accuse him. Uh, but we, all, we also know uh, the law was, uh, was out of its league. Uh, the law was picking on the wrong guy. Um, that uh, uh, this is, uh, again, Jesus is the Lord of the law. And so when the law accused Christ, it was really, uh, it was uh, outclassed. Uh, and, and Christ in this battle, uh, you know, he, he won this victory on the cross, dying and rising again. Uh, the law does not get the final say. It accused him uh, just like it accuses us. Uh, it finally buried him just like the law buries us. Uh, but Christ rose. Uh, he won this victory uh, and continued to speak words of peace to his people so that the law does not get the final say. The law with its accusation, its condemnation, does not get the last word. Christ shows up and the first word that he says to his disciples, remember this, they're hiding behind locked doors. And the first word that he says is not the words of Moses. He doesn't show up in that room and say, guys, you forgot the first commandment. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day on your father and mother, you shall not kill. Th that's not what Christ says when he shows up in that room. He doesn't say, well, the law was right. You didn't keep it, but now you're gonna, you better try harder. No, the first word he says to his disciples is, is a word of grace, mercy. He says to them, peace be with you. Uh, he shows up in that room, that locked room, where the disciples are afraid. Uh, and he says, 
Peace be with you. Uh, because the law will not get the final say. The law has done its worst. It tangled with the wrong guy. Uh, you know, the law uh, was, was trying to accuse its own master. And so now Jesus has the law on a leash. And he says, no, I get the final say. And the, and the final say is that word of his forgiveness. He says to his disciples, peace be with you. Uh, and so, uh, again, verse 5 here back in Galatians. Jesus was born under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. Uh, this is what it means to be redeemed. Uh, we have a new master. Uh, you know, that to be, to be redeemed, Paul has been speaking about uh, what it means to live as a slave or as somebody else's servant. Uh, to be redeemed means that somebody else buys you. Now you are somebody else's property. Uh, you were uh, the slave of the law. Uh, now you are the slave of Jesus Christ. Um, and not only slaves, Paul says, uh, you have not, you're not, you've, been, you've been purchased, you've been redeemed. Uh, but the, the one who redeemed you did not just leave you as a slave, uh, but you have, he has adopted you. You have received adoption as children. So that the, the, the relationship you have with God is no longer as a slave, just being bossed around, told what to do. But you are beloved by the Father. And because, and now verse 6, because you are children... God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit of His Son. Uh, remember how Jesus spoke to God. Uh, Jesus spoke in, the, in those very uh, tender and, and familiar and personal words with His Father. Uh, when Jesus spoke to the Father, it was, it was tender, it was intimate, it was the Son speaking to the Father. Uh, and so this is the same Spirit now that Jesus has given to us. So that just like Jesus knew the Father as one who loved him uh, intimately, uh, we have the same spirit so that we get to speak to God in, in these intimate ways. And so this is why we get this wonderful word, and, and you all know this, that, that word Abba, it's not just a, a Swedish disco band from the 70s. Uh, Abba, this, this, is, this is the way that uh, little Hebrew children spoke to their daddies. Uh, this is like our word Papa, Daddy, uh, this is how you speak to your father, um, you know, the one you, the one you love and trust. Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa. Um, this is how we speak to God in those same intimate terms because we have the same spirit that Christ has. I mean, this is just incredible to think about. Again, if it wasn't the Apostle Paul saying this, we might not believe it. Uh, but Paul is saying that uh, we have the same spirit of Je that Jesus had. Uh, the same spirit uh, that, that, that reached out to God as a loving father. And so Paul says, so you're no longer a slave. Um, you, you may have been redeemed. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and, and apart from faith, we have to deal with the law. Apart from faith, our, our sin has to be held in check. But again, this, the, we, now we have this double life. <laughs> uh, we're, yeah, now, 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 we belong, now we belong to Christ. Uh, and, uh, and so we have this new relationship with God. Not, you're not just a slave. Uh, Jesus said, uh, this was in John's gospel as well, Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer, he said, because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. He says, I called you friends. Uh, you are friends of Jesus, you are the brothers and sisters of Jesus, and you are God's child. Uh, and then Paul says, and if you're a child, then you're also an heir through God. Uh, is the, and so, you know, a child gets to look forward to an inheritance from their parents, um, and uh, uh, you, you also are an heir with a very big estate. Uh, you, uh, you know, you're not just going to get trinkets that were left over from your grandparents' property or something. You are an heir of the kingdom of God. So, now again, Paul is just speaking in this very exalted language here uh, to try to dislodge uh, the law from the, the conscience of the Galatians and, and also for us. Uh, because the law has its place, but it does not belong in the conscience. Uh, the, the, the law should govern uh, the members of our bodies, should govern our lives in the sense that um, uh, as sinners we need to be held in check. As sinners we also need uh, to be told that we are sinners, uh, that we are unrighteous before God. Um, that uh, we are not uh, the masters of our own destiny. We are not, um, uh, you know, we are, we are not 
I just, I don't know, I, I think so much of that, that Pharisee uh, in the temple who just was so proud of himself. God, thank you for not making me like this, this taxpayer over here. Thank you for making me such a good person. I mean, that, that, that's why God gives us the law, to knock us uh, off our high horse, uh, to, to, to knock us down from our pride and say, no, indeed, we are sinners who need the mercy of Jesus. So again, the law has its place. Uh, but, but, but Christ belongs in our conscience. Christ belongs in our ears, uh, saying, you are my brothers and sisters. You are my friends. You are the children of God uh, through, because of what I have done for you on the cross. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll pause there. Uh, and again, it, this is sort of Paul repeating himself. Uh, this, is, this is what Paul does. He's a great preacher. And, and you know, all of us, you, you never just, you're never just going to hear it once. We, you know, and remember it. I mean, we have to hear these things over and over again. This is a relationship of love, you know, where you need to be told, I love you over and over again. You know, I don't just say to my kids, I love you, you know, once in their lives and then say, now remember it because I'm never going to say it again. You know, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not how parents talk to their kids. And so that's not how Paul talks to, to us. He, he'll t say these things over and over again to get Christ back into our ears and into our conscience. So we'll pause there. Uh, and uh, I can, um, you know, uh, let me know any, any questions, reflections, comments. What do you think? How does it sound? Yeah, Pat. Yeah, Pat. Pat. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, as usual, my mind works when I listen to this. Um, I am so grateful to, to Jesus. And I'm grateful for people like Paul back yeah. then. Because while you were talking, my mind went off on a funny trail, as it does on occasion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not that it's that. As much about circumcision. I, before Jesus, and as a woman, I never stood a chance then, did I? Yeah. Back then? Mm hmm Yeah. Or reading that wrong. I mean, how did women... Yeah. I realize that when you look at the Bible, it's mainly men. Yeah. I understand that, too. Yeah. But, like I said, I go off in this buddy's mm -hmm. trails, and I'm yeah. going, I'm glad that Yeah. Really yeah, and, and, yeah and, and really, that would be, you're correct, and that... And it would be a misunderstanding of the law, but once you misunderstand the purpose of the law, it, it'll, it'll leave you in the dark. I mean, if you think your relationship to God is defined by circumcision, well, the best you might hope for, Pat, is to get yourself joined to a man who is circumcised, right? You know? Right. Um, I that. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and, that, and again, this is a, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of the law because what Paul is saying is that, uh, that circumcision was a physical sign, uh, an outward sign of an inner righteousness. And the, and the inner righteousness comes by faith. And the circumcision was just an outward sign of that. Um, and so, you know, circumcision had its place, but it was not supposed to define your relationship to God. Um, and so the, the, real, the real believers of the Old Testament included men and women. You know, uh, it, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac uh, and Rebekah, you know, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, all these beautiful men and women who were righteous by faith. And they knew that whether they were, whether, um, may, they were male or female, they knew the promise was for them. Uh, but, yes, well, if you, once you get that wrong, and once you think that, no, circumcision is actually what makes you righteous before God, um, then, uh, yeah, uh, you uh, better hope to be male or married to someone who is male. And, 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 th and then you'll be okay. <laughs> and if the man you're married to is a good man, even if he, I mean, he can be circumcised and yeah. not a good man. That's right. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Then I got thinking, is that, would that be the, some of the reason that the, the Middle East, so many of the nations in the Middle East treat their women the way they treat them? Or is that strictly, uh, I don't, I guess I don't know enough about their religion yeah. mm -hmm. to know yeah. the answer to that question. Yeah. I began to think, well, maybe that's why it carries over so in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it is interesting. Um, is that there is there are forms of female circumcision uh, in yeah. other other religions. Um, the Jews did not practice female circumcision, uh, but uh, yeah, this this is I would say it's what happens when you understand, um, you know, the gift of of physical strength as a, a way of simply kind of serving your own purposes. Um, that. Uh, you know, if, if you simply look at your, your physical strength, and it, because God has blessed men with testosterone, and, and generally speaking, men become then, you know, physically stronger. Um, if, if you just are going to use that in a self-serving way, you're going to use that to, to put other people down, um, to, to hold other people in bondage, to serve your ends. Um, and, uh, and, and, yeah, this is not how God has, this is not why God has blessed us with gifts, um, you know, is that the, the gifts that God has given to us, you know, he intends to be put in service of our neighbor. Um, and so, you know, when, when Paul is writing and uh, describing the relationship of husband and wife, you know, he'll say that a husband, um, you know, that uh, he'll say that, you know, that the members of the body, they, they serve one another. You know, that is my hand. Uh, last night I stepped, I was walking around barefoot outside and stepped on something and got a nice hole in my foot. You know, so my hands go to work. You know, get the get the antibacterial ointment, get a band-aid, put it on there. The hand, the members of the body ser serve each other, uh, and and Paul says this is how it ought to be with husband and wife, is that um, you know the, the the head doesn't hate the members of his body, but but nourishes them, cares for them, and so if God has given you strength, it's for the purpose of service. Um, and I very much think here of, of uh, Pastor John, uh, and that this is very much in keeping with kind of the crossways understanding of how God has created us, is for service. And, and that sin always curves us inward on ourselves. You know, sin is that, that, uh, that you just worry about yourself, take care of yourself, um, other people are there just to somehow serve your needs. That's the opposite of how God made us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think in other cultures, uh, you know, you can lose sight of that. This is a very basic sinful tendency that applies to all people. Um, but it is Christ, I, I would say, who sets you free. I mean, Christ sets you free from that. Uh, to stop worrying about yourself and then really to see the person next to you as someone in need of your gifts, uh, someone in need of your strength. Uh, so that your strength is not just simply for your own purposes. I can kind of also show you why people, some people, want to stay back in the Old Testament and not want to continue on into the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, you can use the law, you can wield the law like a weapon for your own purposes. Yeah, I mean, the, the gospel, it, it sets you free from that, and some people don't want that freedom, and they like to use the law like a club. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it, you could kind of think of, you know, the, the, the medieval church and what Luther was up against. Um, there were people in power who really were very good at using the law uh, to manipulate others. I mean, the sale of indulgences was a great fundraiser, you know, when you can convince people that you can sort of... Uh, you know, get your relatives or yourself into heaven quicker, you know, by contributing to a fundraiser. That's very, it's good salesmanship. <laughs> and so, yeah, sometimes it's better to leave them in the Old Testament. <laughs> Keep them under the law, then we can control them. <laughs> and again, the law is its place. Um, uh, the, the abuse is when you let it slip into the conscience. And this is what, you know, certainly was happening in the medieval church. It happens uh, all over the world. Um, when you don't want to let really people don't want to let people be free you're worried about what will happen you'll lose control yeah those are great points pat <laughs> i told my kids the other day your mom has i don't know what it is but i go up on these fun sales quite often <laughs> that's good you, you you must have drunk your coffee this morning that's good your brain is you know active <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. When, other. When you, when you study those verses, it's sometimes hard to understand the connection of being God's child. And so I was thinking, I was looking in my picture here, 
picture on the bottom is the old schoolhouse that Jim's great great grandfather built. And so through that picture, I have a connection, a connection, and so it's more understandable. Mm hmm. Yeah. That yeah. actually is what they call the Deeder School. Ah. And it, it was built in 1881 by William F. Deeder, mm. Jim's great grandfather. Yeah. So through that picture and through him, I have this connection like I have with God. Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah, and, and Paul is using these pictures, really, in a sense. I mean, he's, he, last time it was he's using the picture of a schoolmaster. This time he's using the picture of a governor or, you know, like a governess like, like Fräulein Maria um, to help us understand our connection to God. Good. Any other responses, questions, or comments? You are God's children. You are God's children. Uh, Christ won a, a great battle. I mean, this was this was a big battle for Christ. Um, again, the the law it attacked him. Uh, the law bit off more than it, it could chew, really, uh, when it attacked Christ. Uh, but in that battle, Christ won a victory for himself and us. Um, uh, I, I thought it really would be appropriate this week to sing a Holy Week hymn. I gotta grab my hymnal, hold on. But why don't you turn to hymn number 123? I'll be right back. Um, thinking this week uh, about the, this battle that Christ faced. I mean, like I said, these uh, the, the the sweat that became like drops of blood, um, his his cry from the cross, uh, what Christ did for us, uh, being born under the law. Um, you know, that the Son of God did not need to face these things for himself. Uh, he did it for us. Um, you know, it was not uh, his own sins uh, that, that got him on the cross. It was, it was our own. Um, it's, you know, the, the hymns of Holy Week really tell this story for us really well. And so it's maybe a little bit odd to sing a, a Holy Week hymn here in the middle of July. Uh, but it's, this, is, this is what Paul is talking about. So I thought, let's sing 123. Uh, and, uh, and we can really celebrate the gifts of Christ and his mercy, uh, the victory that he won for us. Again, I know the recorder doesn't always come through um, on, the, on this recording, uh, but I'll, I'll play a verse of it, see if, see if you can hear it, and then we'll, we can sing it together. Jesus. Ah, holy Jesus, how hast thou offended that man to judge thee hath in hate pretended by foes derided by thine own rejected Almost afflicted, who was the guilty who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus. I it was denied thee, I crucified thee. Lo, the good shepherd for the sheep is offered, the slave hath sinned, and the son hath suffered. For man's atonement, while he nothing heedeth, God interceded. For me, kind Jesus, was thine incarnation, 
thy mortal sorrow and thy life's oblation, thy death of anguish and thy bitter passion for my salvation. Therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay thee, I do adore thee and will ever pray thee. Think on thy pity and thy love unswerving not my deserving. All right. Uh, good uh, Holy Week hymn. Uh, for me, kind Jesus, was thine incarnation, thy mortal sorrow, and thy life's oblation. I mean, God, Jesus pours himself out for us. Thy death of anguish and thy bitter passion for my salvation. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, good news for us, for us sinners, that Christ has done all of this for us. And that our freedom, our redemption, uh, our, our uh, adoption as God's children was all done uh, by his love and sacrifice. Uh, so, uh, since we are God's children, we get this great privilege of calling out to God as our Father and knowing that he tenderly and lovingly listens to us and will answer our prayers. So, just like Jesus taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, uh, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, children of the same heavenly Father, I hope you all have a great week. Enjoy whether you're going to baseball tournaments or the fair. Maybe I'll see some of you at the fair. Uh, just try to breathe some good clean air out there and uh, stay away from all that smoke. Um, but uh, we'll see you next time. Again, it'll be a couple of weeks uh, before we're able to gather like this again. So go back and watch all those old videos, okay, on YouTube. They're all there sitting there waiting for you. God's peace. God's Bye. peace. Thank you.